Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In the previous video, we started talking about cranial nerve 3, which is the oculomotor nerve. Remember that this is a purely motor nerve. It has no sensory components whatsoever, all motor. And there's two parts of the oculomotor nerve. The part we did in the previous video was that of the general somatic effect, the GSE component of cranial nerve 3. That's what you see here in red. In this component of the oculomotor nerve, we have control of the extrinsic eye muscles. These are voluntary muscles that control movements of the eyeball. And then also there's levator palpebrae superioris, which elevates the eyelid. Those are all voluntary actions, and they're ultimately controlled through this component of cranial nerve 3. But remember, there's also a parasympathetic component of the oculomotor nerve, and that's shown here in blue. And that's what we're going to talk about here in this video. We're actually going to begin by talking about the pathway for the parasympathetic part of the oculomotor nerve. And fortunately, the first part of this is actually identical to what we see for the somatic part of the oculomotor nerve. Uh, the only part that's going to differ really is the exact origin, and also once we get through the superior orbital fissure. Now remember, the oculomotor nerve, like the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 4, originates in the midbrain, which is that superior part of the brain stem. So over here, we have a corresponding picture. We know that this is the midbrain because we've got the red nucleus, paraaqueductal gray matter. This is the midbrain. And there are two components to that oculomotor nucleus. We have the general somatic component right here, which is the previous video, and this other part, EW, which is the Edinger-Westfall nucleus. This is the component that is parasympathetic, and we've got it color-coded here in green. Now, as the oculomotor nerve goes anteriorly from the midbrain, remember that even though I have them drawn separately, uh, the parasympathetic part is going exactly with the somatic part. Okay? So going anteriorly, we're going to cross two arteries. The oculomotor nerve will go over the superior cerebellar artery and then underneath the posterior cerebral artery. And from there, it continues going anteriorly and enters this little tunnel within the sphenoid bone called the cavernous sinus. It travels through the cavernous sinus. Now, once this exits the cavernous sinus, something happens. If we look at the gold part of this, the somatic component, it bifurcates, and we get one division here going left. This is actually the upper division, and this one going right here is the lower division. The reason I mention this is this green parasympathetic part from the Edinger-Westfall nucleus actually still goes with the lower division. And the lower division is then going to exit the cranium through the superior orbital fissure, and that allows it to enter the orbit where the eyeball is. Now, once the lower division here has moved through the superior orbital fissure into the orbit, the parasympathetic part is going to separate from it, okay? Because the lower division here, the somatic part, goes to innervate these three extrinsic eye muscles. And so this branch that comes off here that's parasympathetic is called the ciliary branch. Then the ciliary branch comes over here and enters what we call the ciliary ganglion. Now the ciliary ganglion is not just involved with cranial nerve 3, it's actually also involved with the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. But what happens in here is that these axons of the ciliary branch actually synapse with a new set of neurons, and these neurons go directly either to the ciliary muscle or the constrictor pupillae muscle. Okay. These are two other muscles associated with the eye, but they exist inside the eyeball. Let's talk about their functions. So here's a picture of what we've already looked at. Here's the Edinger-Westfall nucleus in blue. This is the parasympathetic part of the oculomotor nerve. It then, after the bifurcation, follows the lower division and then separates and becomes that uh, ciliary branch eventually entering the ciliary ganglion, where it then synapses with these other motor neurons which go to these muscles. The one going down here goes to the constrictor pupillae muscle, and that's going to cause the pupil to constrict. So up here we have dilated eyes. This is what we would expect to see in a sympathetic response. But here the oculomotor nerve is functioning in the parasympathetic nervous system. So instead of dilating the eyes, we're going to expect the cranial nerve 3 to cause them to constrict them back to normal. And it can even constrict them further than this, make the pupils even smaller. Okay? 
There's also a condition here which can result from damage to the oculomotor nerve on one side, and that's anisocoria. So notice on the patient's right side over here, we have adequate constriction. This is a normal pupil, but on the patient's left side, uh, we see that it's excessively dilated. This could actually result from an inability to control the constrictor pupillae on the patient's left side. It's not necessarily just that, but that could be something involved. So the constrictor pupillae muscle is one of the muscles that's controlled through that ciliary branch of the oculomotor nerve. The other muscle is the ciliary muscle. If we look inside the eyeball, this is the ciliary muscle. It actually goes around the circumference of the lens, which is right here. Now if we look at the bottom first, this is when the ciliary muscle is relaxed. This is what we call an unaccommodated lens. So this is where the lens is kind of flat. It's actually pulled more taut and so it's flat. This is better for seeing things that are further away. So if you're looking at a distant tree or a building or something, your lens is probably going to be unaccommodated and the ciliary muscles will be relaxed. But if the lens were in this position and then you tried to read a book up close, the lens is not going to appropriately be able to focus that image on the retina. Okay, and so you're not going to be able to read that book very well. So in order to read something or look at something that's very close up, you have to have what's called lens accommodations. This is an accommodated lens. In this case, the ciliary muscle is contracted, and notice what it does. It kind of causes the lens to bulge. And when the lens bulges, it becomes better at looking and viewing things up close clearly. Because when the lens is bulged like this, it's better able to focus that image on the retina for clarity. Here's another view of the same thing, but we're looking at it front on. This is actually where the ciliary muscles are relaxed and the lens is flatter. But as soon as we get that parasympathetic function of the oculomotor nerve, and we're looking at something up close, the ciliary muscles contract, and they actually cause that lens to become rounder and bulge out and be better at focusing things on the retina that are up close. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the parasympathetic component of the oculomotor nerve. In the next video, we're gonna briefly look at the trochlear nerve. It's a fairly simple cranial nerve that we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on, but be sure to join us there. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.